One act of kindness can change a person's entire life, and sometimes help comes from the most unexpected places. Today, meet a shopkeeper who made a surprising choice when he caught a shoplifter red-handed. And a man who got a life-saving organ from the last person he expected. This girl's an angel. Hello and welcome to the Humankind Connection. I'm Terry Badu and we start in prison, where the relationship between inmates and prison staff may sometimes get a bit fraught. But beneath the surface, people are people. And when a prison deputy fell seriously ill while on duty, the prisoners responded like heroes. This prison deputy is having a cardiac emergency. Inmates noticed Deputy Warren Hobbs seemed unwell as he escorted them to their cells. He was breathing heavily, he wasn't moving the way he normally moves, and their biggest indicator is they said he took off his hat. Deputy Hobbs always wears a hat, and he took his hat off, and he was really sweating, and he was fanning himself with his hat. So the, de the inmates already had an idea that Deputy Hobbs wasn't feeling well. Then one of the inmates saw the deputy lose consciousness. So Smalls is assigned to a downstairs room, and he was the only one who could see what was happening to Deputy Hobbs initially. Um, he saw Deputy Hobbs at the desk and he saw him fall and hit the floor. So he was banging on his door. So he was the one who really sounded the alarm. Eventually the whole unit was banging on their doors. They were all, you know, banging, calling the deputy's name repeatedly. And Deputy Hobbs later told me he didn't realize he had passed out. He had no idea that he had suffered an emergency. And he could hear Deputy, Deputy, Deputy Hobbs, Deputy, Deputy. And that's actually what woke him to the point that he was semi-conscious and I think he looked up and he saw the inmates in 617 who had a direct you know line of vision with him now that they were in their window looking down at his desk and he popped their door open. The inmates rushed to his aid. Three mic Officer needs help. Before medical in route, deputy assistance. What is the issue with what is the problem with uh, deputy Hobbs? So, what type of injury? Well, before has been requested in route. These inmates didn't question for a second that it was the right thing to do. So I have great respect for law enforcement and the job that they do. So for me, I had to save them. I couldn't just watch the man die like that. Same news for me. Um, maybe I was very respectful. He comes in the unit every night and respects every guy in here, and every guy respects him back. And so we didn't do anything for Deputy Hodge that he would not have did for us, and there's not a doubt in my mind. He's a wonderful man, a good officer, and we're thankful for him, and we can't wait for him to get back to work. This story beautifully illustrates that anyone is capable of greatness, and it also is a great reminder that it's not the uniform that makes the hero, it's the person wearing the uniform. These three inmates have very beautifully illustrated that anyone can be a hero, and we're deeply appreciative of them. When you hear the term essential workers, UPS drivers may not spring to mind immediately. But during the recent pandemic, UPS drivers were a lifeline to many people, delivering not only goods, but much needed contact with the outside world. And in one community, they decided that special effort deserved recognition. Anthony was completing his delivery route when he drove up to this. His customers lined the street to thank him for his essential work. Adults, kids and even dogs showed up to cheer him on. The biggest gift for me is watching his face as he saw why all these people were there. Anthony brings joy to the residents of Holsey. He's been the UPS driver for their neighborhood for five years. Anthony makes you feel like you're his favorite customer. He makes you feel like you're the only person he's serving. That is a massive gift to be able to give to somebody. And it's something that you, as the giver, probably really don't recognize because it's just who you are. Anthony was one of Patty's first friends in her new neighborhood. She moved to Halsey at the beginning of the pandemic. All of the things I've known for a long time aren't there. And it's lonely because you can't meet anybody because you're trying to be safe. And here comes this 
bright light into your dark moment and lightening up your day. Patty found she wasn't the only one who felt that way. The neighbors were eager to show Anthony their gratitude as well. Anthony looks out for us. As an essential worker, he is on the front line, interacting with numerous people every day. And so while the rest of us are on the inside, deciding whether or not to open the door, he doesn't have that option. Those who couldn't make it to the celebration wrote cards, baked treats, and sent ornaments. My biggest concern was Anthony has got such a great work ethic. I was concerned that he might hesitate to enjoy it and take the time to go through it. So I approached the truck. I said, I need to tell you that this is for you. And he said, no, Patty, no. I said, yes. I said, it's for you. And it's a neighborhood that wants to gather and thank you for your kind way. And they just want to show you how much they love you. His supervisors were waiting for him at the end. It's a wake-up call for people, myself included, to know that every interaction you have with another person is impacting their life. You don't know if it's just a, a net neutral or you may be Patty's Anthony. But let's celebrate people all the time, thank people for their kind actions in day-to-day -day interactions and be like people who make you feel good. Those are my hopes for how people that just have just received this might be able to, to move it and pay it forward. Thank you. Now they say good things come in twos and Jeffrey Granger can attest to that after his life was saved not once but twice by a pair of guardian angels. I was uh, in kidney failure and uh, I was on peritoneal dialysis and uh, my kidney doctor had been building me up for a transplant and the uh, phone rang and it was Shans. He said, you got two and a half hours to get down here. We have a perfect match. In 2004, Terry Harrington's life was struck by tragedy when her 35-year-old husband, Brian, was killed in a fall. After Brian's death, I had to kind of take a whole different route as far as what I was going to do with my life. When he passed away 15 years ago, he had already decided to be an organ donor. One of those recipients is uh, Jeff, and he got his kidney and his pancreas. Within a month of Brian dying, we had gotten our first letter. And that was like just hearing from them and how much their life had changed with the fact that my, my husband didn't take them with them and he gave them to somebody else was a healing process and stuff for us in and of itself. Terry wrote a letter with her phone number. I sat down and wrote a recliner and said, what the heck, I'm going to give her a call. Called her up, we talked for 45 minutes. First time we ever talked. Ever since then, we was, we've just kept in touch for the last 14 years, you know. Within a month of the surgery, Jeff and his family got in touch to thank Terry for Brian's organs. Then we have people dying every single day that take organs with them that are good, that can go for somebody else and extend their life. So if you have something healthy and somebody needs it, why not? Over the next 15 years, a friendship blossomed. Then out of the blue, Terry got a worrying call. And Jeff called me and he's like, oh, I really hate to tell you this, but the kidney's failing. And I'm like, oh, well, that's just kind of funny, Jeff, because I've actually been thinking about this, that I need to be a, a living donor, so what do I got to do? Jeff couldn't believe it, but Terry was serious. I said, well, I'll mail you a packet if you're really interested. And she said, I'm not really interested. You're getting my kid. Incredibly, just like Brian's organs, Terry's kidney was a perfect match. And for the second time, Jeffrey's life was saved. We didn't become organ donor and transplant recipient. We became family through a connection of the organ donation and it's been that way and will stay that way. I mean, I don't know how strong a relationship could be, you know, this girl's an angel, you know. I don't know how I could thank you or how I could repay you for such a wonderful life, you know, giving gift. She's a one of a kind. When a musical maestro lost full use of his hands due to a crippling disorder, it could have been the end of his career. 
But thanks to the kindness and ingenuity of a technical wizard, there's music in the air once again. Maestro João Carlos Martins hasn't played like this in more than 20 years. He might never have played again had fate not brought a selfless stranger into his life. Uh, for 22 years, I was not able to put uh, my 10 fingers on the keyboard. 24 years ago, I gave my last concert with both hands. The maestro became known as one of the greatest interpreters of Johann Sebastian Bach. But all while his star was rising, the maestro was fighting a battle in his own body. I gave my last concert in Beijing in 2002. And after the 23rd surgery, the doctors, they told me that I would not be able to play piano professionally anymore. In 2019, a fellow Brazilian first heard about the maestro and his difficulties. I was watching a TV show and, and saw him on interview. And he was saying that he was saying goodbye to his hands like a farewell because he was going to have a surgery on his hands. And I thought, if I couldn't do anything to help him, maybe something simple. And then I started to, th to think about it and to, to build something to, to him. So the master has the strength to close his hands, but not to open them. So the glove pulls his fingers back. Uh, so when his fingers press the keys, the gloves pulls them back. Then he built these first, these gloves. And then I realized that I could, after 22 years, I could touch uh, the keys with all my fingers. Of course, that I cried. So I went to my piano, I played. Finally, I play. I was able to play one music, a two and a half minutes music by Johann Sebastian Bach, as I used it to play uh, 40 years ago or 30 years ago. And this, for me, was like a, a miracle. The gloves were a gift to the maestro, so he could play on weekends, but he started to play everywhere to, to everyone. I will not be the same pianist that I used to be before, but I can play uh, with all my heart, uh, even with uh, even trying to express myself with with my heart in a better way than than I used to do it before. Now, normally kindness is not the natural response when you find out someone's stealing from you. But when a shop owner learned why a teen was shoplifting, he didn't alert the police. Instead, he helped the boy. Jay saw a teenager acting suspiciously on his store's surveillance camera. I saw that he was taking something and going to one corner of the store. Coming back, there was nothing in his hands. I rewinded the video and I saw that he's putting something in his pocket. First of all, I was upset, I was angry because if somebody is stealing, they basically, it feels like he's taking money from my pocket. If you're stealing from the store, you're stealing from my pocket. He approached the teen and asked him to empty his pockets. Jay said the teenager pulled out candy and junk food, not worth more than $20. He asked his employee to call 911, then asked the teen an important question. And I asked him, why, why are you doing this? He said, I'm hungry. I'm stealing it for myself and my younger brother. When he said, I'm hungry, the whole thing changed. The whole perception changed. This is not a regular shoplifter. 
a regular shoplifting incident. It is something different. I said, if you are hungry, I'll give you food. Don't try to steal these candies and gums and junk items. You're not going to fulfill your hunger with that. That's useless. Jay's anger turned into sympathy, and he had his employee hang up with 911. He gave the teenagers sandwiches and hot food to eat. I thought, okay, he did something wrong. At least give him another chance. Maybe he will do it right next time. Show him what is right, what is wrong. And I hope he learns that. If he goes to jail, what is he going to learn? Nothing. He will learn all bad things in jail. And uh, that will become a permanent record. Jay didn't know a customer in the store wrote a Facebook post about what happened. By the next day, his act of kindness had inspired thousands. But Jay thinks it was simply the right thing to do. It's always important to help kids. I think they're the future of the country. If we try and we do something, if it is able to make some change, that's what we are there for. When it comes to thanking our unsung heroes, the dedication of teachers often goes unnoticed. Amanda is one of those teachers. Unable to afford a car, her commute to work each day was long and arduous. And that sacrifice struck a chord with Courtney, whose daughter is in Amanda's class. And so she and her husband decided to do something about it. So he said you were having, you were actually catching a bus, mm -hmm. uh, coming to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I just felt a little compelled. He wanted to do something. And he wanted to gift you with something. Gifts me with, oh my gosh, gift me with what? You're kidding, right? Like, like you're really kidding. Are you serious? Amanda had no idea how her life was about to change. You're really serious. Serious. Oh my gosh. We don't want you to have to catch the bus or try to get to work. Oh my gosh, to... like I don't even know what to say. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like I cannot believe this. Oh my gosh. Thanks to Courtney and her husband, Amanda was the owner of her first new car. And their generosity was overwhelming. When my husband had mentioned, you know, her and her situation, it was just like something just kind of like came over me. So just pretty much got up that morning and I was like, I'm just going to buy her a car. And I was like, you want to come? And he was like, yeah, let me get dressed. Let me get showered. Oh my gosh. Okay. So like, what do I need to know? I mean, like, <laughs> what kind of car do I have? <laughs> oh my gosh. That's one of the keys. So we can go over here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Y'all like, I just like, I just don't. No, no, oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Wow. <laughs> wow. Like, so wow. <laughs> I feel blessed. I feel um, excited. I feel, um, I don't know how I feel yet. Um, I think I'm still kind of nervous and excited and anxious and I don't even know. I don't so know. No more um, standing in the cold. No more standing in the cold. No more riding the bus. No more waiting on somebody to come and pick me up. Yeah, no more of any of those things. No Yay. more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and my gosh, and you're filming this. I, I just know, realized you're it. Oh my gosh. 
Is there someone out there who's helped you get where you are today? Well, we want to help you give them the thanks they deserve. Send an email to humankindvideos at gmail.com and we'll do the rest. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Humankind Connection. Thanks for watching. I'm Terry Badu. We hope to see you next time. Bye for now.